Hey, Internet, it's Jake from Mini Terrain Domain, and this is Saltwater Sanctuary Dawnbringers Ghosts of Saltmar Season 3, Episode 3. Happening every Thursday night right here on twitch.tv slash mini terrain domain and boy is it good to be back uh we've only been off for one week uh but we were two weeks ago we were down um megan uh tonight we are unfortunately down uh jeremy possibly he'll be jumping in when he can due to um very bizarre circumstances with power outages and things like that around him um wild magic surges i'm guessing uh so hopefully uh he'll get a chance to pop in here he'll let us know when he's ready and we will get that going and look at that right off the bat fellowship of the tables subscribing that's gonna bump you guys up on your domain dice so i guess i should probably tell you what domain dice are if you're new to mini terrain domain you may be wondering what the heck is a domain die and why are there a bunch of dice and numbers above my head the scroll down below also explains that and fellowship of the tables as just type to the keyword exclamation point domain for a simple tip of five dollars or 500 bits or a subscription resubscription raids all those good things you can have an impact on the game in the form of these domain dice the players can spend those domain dice to make me re-roll a d20 to re-roll a d20 themselves gain out of healing or excuse me out of rest healing uh, turn failed death saving throws into successful death saving throws and even do super criticals with the patron's blessing five domain dice which was used in the last session for the second time by the same person who used it the first time uh jeremy not afraid to use those when the situation calls for it um when when fighting the uh sahu again um i looked up i actually listened D D beyond uh has the pronunciations and matt mercer's dulcet tones told me it is sahu again not sahu again or whatever the heck i was calling them uh last week um but we'll get into that in just a moment but speaking of D D beyond you may notice the D D beyond logo all the way down there in that lower corner that is because mini terrain domain is powered by D D beyond if you're watching the stream on twitter nope on twitch online uh you can mouse over the window and you will see a pop-up on the left side of the screen with all of the characters and that is uh supposed to be real-time updates you can click on one of those characters and see their character sheet their stats all that cool stuff we absolutely love uh the fact that D beyond has given us insider access and that we can um have this extra level of um just technical support i guess is a weird way to say it but i love having multiple windows open on my browser of DD beyond so i can quickly look up rules spells monsters what have you it's absolutely fantastic um yeah as fellowship says if you're watching on twitter you must be a wizard or something um uh let's see also down in the lower left corner, you'll notice the logos for Jasper's Game Day and Initiative Coffee Company. Mini Terrain Domain is a partner with Jasper's Game Day, a tabletop gaming organization based here in Michigan, but serving the community around the world with the mission of trying to uh, provide support and eliminate suicide. Um, you can type Jasper in the chat, as Fellowship has just done, or you can go to the uh, the panel down below on twitch here and that link will take you directly to the donation page for jasper's game day any money donated to them goes to fund suicide prevention crisis centers um and while we're talking about that it's important that you know that you matter you matter to us you matter to other people and if you feel that is not the case if you feel you need somebody to talk to Please, at any time, you can type exclamation point help in the chat and you will get the phone number to the National Suicide Hotline, 
at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. Or you can text 741-741. Please do not hesitate to call that number if you need somebody to talk to. Trained professionals are on the other end of that line. Um, so uh, please use that number if you need it. And one last tie-in with Jasper's Game Day and Suicide Prevention is Initiative Coffee Company. If you type coffee in the chat, you will have a link to Roast Coffee, a medium blend of Brazilian and Peruvian beans. Um, This coffee is a partnership between myself and Initiative Coffee Company with, for every 12-ounce bag that you purchase... Um, three dollars of every bag, uh, of every purchase goes to benefit Jasper's game day. Um, and it's really good coffee. Um, I know cause I personally selected the roast. Uh, so I highly recommend it. Um, I do believe that is all the, inno- nope. I almost forgot again. You let me forget last time and where I think we're only going to have one more game before it's over. So I'm actually going to turn this over for just a couple minutes to Ted, who is going to tell us about something really cool Nerdarchy is doing. And I think he's going to show us something really cool besides that sweet shirt that he's wearing, which you can purchase yourself um, by going down below into the panels and click on the merchandise button. Uh, and you can buy a shirt just like that designed by me, the mini terrain domain tavern shirt. But Ted, Tell us what Nerdarchy's got going on. So over on Kickstarter, we have out-of-the-box encounters. It is 55 encounters that you can be able to drop right into your game. Each encounter is scalable. Each encounter is designed to take multiple strategies into account. Uh, So whether you have somebody that doesn't show up one night, whether you have, uh, you know, the, the players taking a turn that you did not expect and you want to just be able to grab something right off your shelf, out of the box encounters is the perfect solution for that. The appendix in the back is going to be able to, you know, have the encounter sorted by the different terrains that, you know, the, the that the encounters could be at. So if you happen to be in the grasslands, boom, go to that section and you can run two or three of those, cover your night and you're golden. Uh, so it's an amazing Kickstarter. We're really proud. This is our first and it's doing so well. We've already unlocked all of the additional book content that, that, uh, that we had planned within it. We've got, you know, different print and play stuff that's been unlocked. We've unlocked our, our own Nerdarchy portal on d d Beyond to get the encounters that are going to be in this book. We've partnered with um, Norse Foundry um, to, to have Nerdarchy dice that are going to be drop shipped for anybody that wants to get on, get in on that, whether you want just the D20 or the, the full set. Uh, we've unlocked Fantasy Grounds integration. Uh, it's 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 crazy uh we have one really big stretch goal at you know two hundred thousand with another cool one at seven at 175 that uh you know that's that's all we're going to be able to have uh we we've, we've run ourselves dry with ideas on this i know the, all of the amazing people out there who are supporting it super super thankful super excited uh and we've got about nine days left so go ahead and check it out uh you know and as far as what i'm you know what i'm going to show off Dave and I are fresh back from Gen Con and we decided the, the YouTube channel is this close to 100,000 subscribers. We had done over $100,000 uh, on the Kickstarter. So we were going to do something crazy. And what we did was we got Nerdarchy tattoos. So I have got the Nerdarchy end emblazoned upon my shoulder for all time. He got the Nerdarchy Goblin Bomber. Uh, he's going to put the end behind the Goblin at some point in time. But we, we have this much faith in what Nerdarchy is and does that we, ha- we had to do it. And we're, we're super stoked to, to do it. So, yeah. That is so incredibly cool. And congratulations on blowing your goal out of the water. Um, and it's still going. It's still going. So um, we'll be very excited to see where that ends up at the end. Um, I do want to touch back one quick second on the um, – on the – National Suicide Hotline, uh, Edain31003 in the chat actually had a really good, helpful tip. Uh, If you do need to call that number, uh, you can press 1 after calling if you are a veteran 
Um, and presumably that'll take you directly to somebody that's more skillfully trained to deal with veteran issues. Um, and, uh, I'm glad to hear, uh, from those that are using the number or have used it in the past that you've gotten the help that you need. Um, and thank you to everybody who's watching right now and, and uh, stick around with us cause we're going to have some fun D and D let's go ahead and we're going to recap what happened in the previous session and then we'll get back into the game so you guys have uh set sail you met the captain of the evangeline a merchant sailing ship uh the captain a human man rather dashing if i do say so myself goes by the name of Captain Dervish, Captain Stark Dervish. Upon boarding the vessel, you met his first mate, um, a rather unique individual in that he is a spectator, which is a large floating body with a single eye, a wide toothy mouth, and four, um, four uh, eye tentacles. And he insisted that every single individual boarding the ship request permission to do so and you all did and were granted permission uh once all of you and your um your charges which are uh the dwarven mining operation leader uh manistrad copper locks um and the uh 25 uh dwarven um miners that were brought along as we indicated in the last time i may not have said this on stream it may have been afterwards um but there are of the 25 there is a mining operation boss and then there are three shift bosses which leaves three si shifts of seven dwarves each that was entirely by accident but yes there are groups of seven dwarves that are miners um and they are all on board the ship you began traveling along the open waters of the shining sea heading for what you were told would be a a 10 day or more journey to the land of kaoland uh to the region known as salt marsh salt marsh on the azure sea while you were traveling and talking getting a little bit of information from the captain who seemed uh, less interested in talking politics um you it was spotted that there was a small skiff in the water and as you got closer you found that there were three dead humanoids inside and then a number of i believe there were four of them uh, a number of uh, Sahuagin blade masters climbed on board and began attacking. You all worked together and quickly dispatched these uh, evil fish people and threw their bodies overboard. Captain Dervish, uh, in a rush, grabbed Griveth and Cantriel upon noticing that they were magic users summoned them to the ship's wheel up on the quarter deck had them each grab a hold of a rung on the ship's wheel and then he did so as well because you also learned during the fight that captain dervish is also a bit of a magic user himself and the last thing that was seen was where the evangeline was floating in the sea there were the bodies of the Sahuagin, there was the skiff with the three dead bodies inside, and nothing but open water. The Evangeline had vanished completely. And that is where we are going to pick up with today's session, which is entitled Saltwater Sanctuary. And by way of starting this session, I would like each of you to make a dexterity saving throw. So is this immediately, uh, you know, after what happened last session or has there been any time to rest and what have you? There has, this is literally 
the the next moment. Okay. So there has been no time to rest from last session. Thirty twenty. So, uh, and actually, anybody um, except for Griveth and Cantriel uh, will do so with advantage. Because everybody had been instructed to grab hold of something. You had all seen people that were lashing, grabbing the lashings. Although technically Cantriel said that she was holding on to uh, Captain Dervish with her other hand. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Maybe. (laughs) Well, I just remembered that because Griveth said, can I hold on to Cantriel? (laughs) You immediately said no, because I'm I'm holding holding on to the the captain. captain. And actually, Captain Dervish's position between between the two of you. Right. Uh, So what did everybody get for their dexterity saving throws? And I'll make one for Dervish as well. 16. 30, 20. 14 here. Six. Okay. So Fig, Dervish, and Griveth all fail their saving throws. Um... I need one moment. Oh, of course. Why is it trying to do that? I have a, sorry, I have a software program that is trying to run an update right now. Does Windows. It's not Windows trying to update, so that's good. I think I can just let that, oh, no, 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 no. It's 100% affecting my stream. It just blew out my CPU usage. Oh no. Hold on. Uh oh. I don't know what's going on. According to this, we're in the red and we dropped a bunch of frames. Uh how is the audio audience? I just want to make sure that's going good. This has been a terrible week for streamers. It's um I ready. have had bad internet connection. Jeremy's had power issues that affected our game. Um, well, I should say first all streamers, except for, well, it seems like Meg, we had a great game on Tuesday. Uh, okay. It looks like it just bumped back up into the green. It may have been that this, uh, software that decided it wanted to update, um, was eating into the CPU, CPU, uh, cause it looks like I dropped about 4,000 frames. Da, 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 da. Okay, I apologize for that. I hate getting all technical on everybody. Um, but when you see your stream <laughs> isn't doing good, uh, it makes you worry. Uh, audio is good, but cuts out sometimes. Okay, thanks, Und- Undead King. Um, I think we're back in the green. Um, I'll keep an eye on that. Okay, so Griveth, Fig, and Captain Dervish all get um kind of tossed a bit as you all feel somewhere within you you feel as if around your midsection around like your gut you feel like somebody has just grabbed your stomach and twisted you feel like a sudden uh almost like a cramping like an intense stomach cramp just grab at you And then you all instantly lurch as the entire ship just suddenly sort of jolts. There's a tremendous spray that shoots up over the bow. Salt water sort of slams into you. Uh, Between you uh, or next to you, Cantriel, you see um, Dervish is suddenly slammed forward, slamming his chest into the ship's wheel. And then immediately thrown sideways, slamming into Griveth, and the two of them go collapsing uh, in a tumble on the quarter deck. Fig, you were up near the bow of the ship. How? What happens to Fig as you now? You rolled a six, so I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you I'm still gonna give you narrative control, but I want you to describe to me what happens and how it is that Fig is thrown overboard. I can imagine that the lurching feeling for others in their stomachs is a literal grinding of gears in Fig's midsection as the gears slow and they almost seem to scrape against one another. And I think for the first time, 
big feels pain, real, actual pain that that registers in his body. And I think with that, he would immediately let go of whatever he was holding on to and clutch at his stomach where these gears are just grinding up against one another. And with that lurch, he's not holding on to anything. And he just flies like like a bird, like a, like a metal bird. <laughs> So I'm also going to do, uh, I'm going to do a mass, I'm going to do it by sides, actually, I think. Um, I'm going to do one for the port side, one for the starboard side. For the crew, um, at advantage, because they all grabbed hold. Uh, so port side, good thing it's at advantage, because I rolled a 1 and a 15. Uh, and then on starboard side, there's an at 20. Um, so the crew all s secured themselves very well, which it bodes very well for Fig, who... As you, you don't even, before you hit the water, you hear, man overboard! And immediately crew begins rushing around. And Cantriel, um, with your high passive perception, you would notice this. Plus you're on the quarter deck, so you have a view looking forward uh, at the whole ship. Um, and you see as from your vantage point as fig is tossed over the um starboard bow into the water uh already crew is beginning to scramble around and grab at uh some ropes but what would the rest of you like to do in this moment uh, can't really actually be she'd be screaming fig at the top of her lungs so I, I, you know, I think I was on the deck near near Fig when all of this uh, was going on. That's up to our mighty DM if that's accurate or not. Um, so my my plan um, was to to grab rope and be able to you know try to assist. I'm not a confident enough swimmer that I'm diving in after him, but yeah. So. I would say even if you weren't immediately next to him when he went overboard, based on your positions earlier, you'd still be able to, in this moment, uh, take action. Uh, did you say you were throwing rope down or you were jumping overboard after him? I, I, I while I'm good at athletics, I don't think Thorgarn's ever swam. So I don't think he's quite confident enough to just go diving into the ocean where, you know, shark men are going to, gonna be but he is definitely <laughs> he is definitely looking for a fig and he's definitely throwing rope okay so you are assisting with the crew so thorgarn i'm gonna have you um i'm gonna have you make a i'm gonna have you actually roll it as an attack with advantage okay uh, so you can just just roll a d20 and add your your strength modifier. Um, you're not going to add proficiency bonus because you are not uh, proficient. Well, are you proficient in sailing? Uh, no, I do not have vehicles water. Yeah, I need you to make a use rope check. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a throwback. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, you're basically going to make an attack versus, uh, um, that's a 15 just strength. Okay. So fig, I want you to make a dexterity check, uh, and see what you get. This is just a check, not a saving throw. I got an eight. <clears throat> So as you go into the water, Fig, and there's this moment where you're tossed into the surf and this salt water immediately, your whole body is just jolted as you've basically fallen about, probably about 20 feet uh, down into the water. You slam into it. Uh, you're actually going to take um, ooh, 11 bludgeoning damage as you hit the water. Um. As you're thrashing around in the water, you see several crew gathering at the rail, 
and you see Thorgarn leading as he grabs the rope from a crew member and hurls these links of rope down towards you. But you were already beginning to sink. And I want you to tell me what is going through Fig's mind as you are once again submerged in water, probably for the first time in a very long time. Yes, for the first time in a long time, but he's immediately brought back to when he spent years or months, years underwater, walking around at the bottom. And he doesn't make a move to swim because he knows that he cannot. He's much too heavy. This is the logical part of his brain. He wonders what the bottom of this ocean floor would be like. He wonders what kinds of things he could find there. He wonders if his friends will miss him. And he is brought back. He hears this strange echoey voice. You will be, be, be perfection, perfection, perfection. He hears this in the back of his mind and he hears the clanging of tools. He feels that same searing hot pain in his stomach, but it radiates everywhere. He knows he's felt this pain before but he can't remember where, but it is associated with that deep voice. And Fig just closes his eyes. Back up on board the ship, Dervish, Captain Dervish, is pulling himself up, disentangling from Griveth. Griveth, there's this moment where you're lying on your back, and remind me, were you wearing your armor or had you stripped down to your linens? You had stripped down, hadn't you? Uh, I wasn't down to my <laughs> linens, but I did have like a just a where I was just wearing a tabard. Right, because like there was tabard. concern about you getting sunburned. <laughs> <laughs> I remembered that. Um, I wore the tabard to dinner. So there's this point <laughs> where, uh, where you're laying on your back and Captain Dervish is actually, uh, like, you guys are chest to chest. He's sort of laying on you a little bit crossways, and he just kind of disentangles himself and pushes himself off of you, getting to his feet really quick. And then he holds his hand down towards you uh, to grab your hand and pull you, help pull you to your feet. And he begins looking around. Status report! Where is everybody? Man overboard, Captain! The clockwork went overboard. Cantriel, are you still there on the quarter deck? Probably at that point, yes. Oh, like looking over to see if she can see what's happening. Uh, you've pretty much seen Fig go overboard. You saw Thorgarn attempting to throw to help the crew throw ropes down, and okay. you saw uh, Fig sink, and the rope just sort of hit the water and kind of just sit there. Oh, okay. I was just looking to see. Um, then, yeah, I'd probably be zipping right past them, trying to get further down to where the action's happening. Okay. Griffith, what about you? Once you're pulled to your feet, what are you doing? I'm trying to scramble down to the lower deck, too. All right. Uh, so, basically, you guys will need to make your way through the uh, midship and back to the sort of to the forecastle area where you'll kind of go up have to rise up the deck uh, up a set of stairs uh, to that that four deck um, while everybody's sort of moving in Thorgarn what are you doing so um, at this point in time uh, you know I'm I, we we just had a, a massive battle we we we're somewhat out of sorts somewhat out of power uh, but I, I'm you know at this point in time I have to I have to think to um you know to to my god to to moradin to, to find out what can be done uh i'm 
while I don't have my armor, I have my weapons belt, uh, which happens to include uh, my, my light hammer, my smithing hammer. So I, you know, seeing that uh, Fig has gone underwater, never seen him swim. Don't know if machines have the ability to, to swim or, you know, metal people, however you want to look at it. Um, so he's, he's going to cast Guidance, tie, tie a rope to his hammer, and throw it in in the hopes that, you know, it will, it will make its mark and find its way to Fig. Fig, I need you to roll me a D10. That is a one. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you've cast guidance. You've you've prayed a prayer to Moradin. Tied your hammer off to this rope and thrown it in the water. Um, roll me another attack roll or d20 roll rather um add your strength modifier because of the hammer i'm gonna have you roll with advantage and then add your d4 for your guidance bam that's what i was looking for uh so strength modifier d20 and a d4 that is a natural 20 for a total of 27 This time, you throw the hammer right where you saw Fig sink below the surface. About this time, Cantriel, you arrive over as Thorgarn has done this. You see what he's doing. Griveth, as you're making your way to the forecastle, you see... Talmud slumped against the gunwale where he ha has his arm still wrapped around uh, one of the ropes but it looks like there's a couple of broken barrels near him um, and it looks like a barrel came loose in the uh, whatever happened and struck him and he appears to be unconscious now for let me just check something here. Yeah. Okay. So big. The brightness of the sun shining through the water up above is irising down into a more defined circle as around the periphery of your vision, the sea takes on dark blue and then gradiates into black as you are sinking ever deeper into this water you looking below you you see that you as you look down you can see kind of in all directions you can see the sand a few hundred feet down you can see the waving of kelp forests uh, you see uh, off in one area, a large school of fish. You hear this sort of of whale song off in the distance. None of this is strange to you. These are all familiar things that you are easily able to identify from your time under the sea previously. But directly below you, the ocean floor seems to in a irregular circular shape that's probably about well actually i'll tell you i'm using a lot of the new rules from the of the ships in the sea section uh, which i really love in ghost of salt marsh because there's a lot of roll tables uh so this area ooh, wow this area is about a thousand feet uh across below you an area of darkness where it almost looks like the ocean floor dips down 
and goes who knows how deep. And that's what you are descending toward. Rising up out of the darkness, you see movement. And what you see, another random roll here, is oh, uh, 11 forms begin to take shape. Similar to the figures that just moments before you were fighting on board the deck of the Evangeline. Uh, though they seem a little more um, primitive uh, and they don't wear the plate armor that the others wore. Um, but they're definitely moving very rapidly through the water as they're swimming upward towards you. Out of your vision, the, out of your peripheral vision, you see suddenly something moving very close to your shoulder. This is a thing you do not expect to see in the ocean. It is a hammer with a rope tied to it. As it just moves past you a few feet, already beginning to lose some of its momentum. And a quick glance up, you can see there's not a whole lot of slack, and there is very uh, very little room of it left below you before you will pass it. Uh, if you would like to attempt to grab the rope, I need a dexterity um, check from you. Yes, please. <laughs> and don't don't forget there are domain dice if you don't feel that you roll just well a couple enough. domain dice there's <laughs> 71 domain dice <laughs> well that's that's a 20 dirty 20 so all right um and uh so you are able to reach out and grab hold of this um hammer tied to a rope thorgarn you feel between your hands as this rope with the hammer tied to it is moving quickly through your hands. And you see that you are running out of slack. So, And then you uh, suddenly feel it grow taut in your hand. Something has grabbed hold of the other end. So I figured at this point in time, you know, while, while I'm not a skilled, you know, uh, water person, I've spent time, you know, doing lots of dwarven things and, you know, hauling up rope in the tunnels is not unheard of when you're, you know, mining and doing what have you. So the the natural instinct of just, you know, wrapping it around your forearm to kind of give you that extra. Uh, and I'll yell, I got him. And anybody that wants to just kind of help give me a heave ho to pull him up, I would be into, yeah, very grateful. Cantrell would absolutely grab the rope hearing that without question. All right, Griveth, were you? We're gonna we're gonna cut over for a minute to Griveth. Were you paying any mind to the unconscious form of Talmud, uh, or in the moment were you trying to help as well? I see Talmud, and he's he's probably actually in bed. It's probably actually uh, I know he's he's tough. You know, um, he's probably in better shape because he's actually prone on the deck, <laughs> so he's probably in better shape than we are actually. Uh, so I am just, I, I glance over for a moment just to look as I kind of skid back past him on the deck and slam um, into Talmud, almost pushing him off the ship. But um, <laughs> I get I get my footing and I just kind of wrap my arms around, I don't know how... You mean Thorgarn? was like grabbing onto Talmud. You mean Thorgarn? I kind of wrap my arms around the whole lot and just kind of just pull back like you know just as many people as we can get pull on this rope you mean thorgarn thorngarn yes <laughs> it, threw me, I it threw me up. I, say, I said talmud you said I? talmud and i said you mean thorgarn like three times <laughs> i saw v over Pirates in the corner the going yeah and the and the, yeah <laughs> yes, okay thorgarn. so uh with cantriel and Grivis assistance and the very stout dwarven barbarian. Um, I'm going to have you roll strength with advantage and we'll see what happens. Uh, who is rolling this, sir? You are rolling. All right. Uh, let's. Uh, just strength. 
Yeah, just a well, yeah, just a D twenty Nin- strength. Nineteen. Nineteen. Um, and then uh your guidance was a one time thing, so I uh, yes, yes. All right. So uh you feel, Fig, that your descent below the deeps uh stops and the rope you feel pulling you upward through the water. You see the form above you, the silhouette of the hull of the Evangeline as you are, it is growing larger in your vision as you are being pulled upward through the water. Looking below you, those 11 figures seem to be matching your speed and some of them even seem to be moving a little bit quicker heading up towards the ship. So, I believe we had already decided that f- the fireball would work in water. Yes, yeah, so in magic. my games, magical fire absolutely works in water. So that is exactly what he is going to let loose on these things. I can imagine, and I can almost imagine it almost like propels him up a little bit <laughs> from just the force of the fireball okay so this is this is how this is going to work and just a heads up megan your mic is starting to break a little bit um i don't know what it is you do to try to fix that so um no worries you know fig is underwater we talked about this before we went live fig is underwater so it just might well uh it's just in character that's what it is um so what is the range on your fireball again uh so 120 or is it 80 feet? I can't remember what. It's a 150. I like I like how we all know exactly what it is until somebody asks the question, what is it? <laughs> okay, so I'm absolutely going to say that they they are in range for you to make this attack. So I'm going to have them make um deck saving throws. And then I'm going to have everybody roll for initiative. Don't you love it when your DM puts you guys into one fight right after you had a fight? But just to just to be clear, though, Megan rolled the one on the D10. Uh, all right, so that's... Let me do this. You're pitting us against each other? What? I didn't I'm say. Sorry, you, you will play <laughs> yes, you will. You will be fighting against Fig. <laughs> All right. So, uh, what is your save DC? Um, my save uh, sixteen. And they have a. All right. Um. So the one fails, two fails, three, four, five. That was eight. So five have failed so far. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. Oh, and two natural ones. Um, so actually eight of the eleven have failed and will take full damage from your fireball underwater. So roll the damage. That will just take me one moment <laughs> to add it up. And then... As as Megan is calculating the damage, Thorgarn, Griveth, and Cantriel, with some of the crew of the Evangeline around you, uh, Dervish is not there as he has stayed behind at the at the wheel for the moment, but is watching from the quarter deck. You see, you just begin to see the form of Fig, almost sparkling. Uh, with sunlight cutting through the water and catching some of the metallic uh, parts of his body below the surface of the water. And then suddenly you see this just flash of that blue arcane energy that you typically see from Fig. And then below Fig, you see this, you don't hear anything, you just see this expansion of these these blue arcane flames and suddenly fig is propelled out of the water in a spray just a 
geyser of salt water splashing up against all of you. You sort of come back a little ways and Thorgarn, you managed to hold on. Actually, actually, we'll see if you manage to hold on. Uh, make me, make me a, uh, strength check with advantage because you still got the others holding on to you. Fourteen. Um, you don't quite, you feel the rope come loose in your hands, but Fig has actually been propelled upward from this blast and Cantriel and Griveth, Thorgarn, you kind of, as the rope comes loose, you do that thing where you were straining against the tension of Fig's weight. And because you lost your grip, you stumble back a little bit. So you're not going to be able to make this check. Cantriel and Griveth, Fig is now flying upwards towards you. You can each make a dexterity save, um, or not save, check, to try to grab hold of Fig as he is flying upwards out of the water. That'll be a 25. And what about Griveth? Seven for me. Uh, Thorgarn bumps into Griveth. You get kind of pushed back as well. Cantriel, you just reach out and you're able to grab hold and sort of with this unforeseen strength, you just sort of almost pivot your body and use the upward momentum that Fig already had and kind of throw him unceremoniously over the railing uh, as he clatters to the deck. And as the spray is blasting upwards, you hear this sort of thwoom of something massive underwater. And then you see thwoom, 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 splashes all too familiar as you've just seen them not too long before, literally only at this point a few minutes ago when the Sahuagin Blademasters attacked. These ones are much more primitive, but these green-skinned creatures wearing armor that seems to be made of bits of broken uh, oyster shells, uh, conch shells, uh, you see spiky protrusions that look like uh, sea urchins on them. Um parts of their armor that have like uh, mollusks and mussels attached to them as they begin landing on the deck all of them brandishing these wicked looking multi-pointed uh, spears and what was actually I'll tell you how many land on the deck uh, based on Megan's damage roll for Fig I rolled uh, 36 <clears throat> holy crap okay I'm going to retcon that just a little bit as you see <laughs> As three of the 11 make it up on deck, uh, that actually wipes out eight of the 11 in one blast. <clears throat> so three of these creatures, and they actually look, you see a couple of them, uh, despite that they came out of the water, they appear to be burned. Uh, it, it actually has manifested as angry uh, light green and purple welts and instant blistering across their chests and their arms. Uh, what did everybody get for um, your initiative rolls, starting with Griveth? I got an 18. All right, Griveth got an 18. Cantriel? Eight. <laughs> Thorgarn? 20. Fig? Also an 18. Okay, so uh, Griveth and Fig will... Oops, no, that's, they'll go second. Uh, Thorgarn will go first. Um, the Sahuagin will go third. And Cantriel will go last for the first time in a long time. Uh, that's only because uh, Talmud isn't here. <laughs> Talmud is unconscious, drenched in what appears to be ale as a barrel of ale has broken across him, uh, knocking him unconscious. So he's probably okay. Uh, so Thorgarn, seeing these creatures land on the deck, what would you like to do? Was that only three of them? How, how close or close are they together? Uh, 
they're not super close. Um, I would say they probably landed about um, 10 feet away from each other. Uh, one, uh, two of them actually landed right on the four deck with you. And then a couple landed, uh, or one landed on the, just like below where the stairs go down to the uh, uh, midship right, or well mid deck. Yeah, I'm just going to, you know, pull the weapons off my back and uh, start laying into them. Uh, I'll go with the, the closest one and see how things go. All right. Uh, so first attack is a natural 20. Okay. Uh, so that is... Uh, you won't even need to roll damage. Just tell me how you kill that one. Uh, so my old primary weapon is um, my my Warhammer. And I just, I just, you know, cave in, you know, neck into uh, his, his, you know, upper torso and into his chest. And he just literally like, he just got there and he's already pushed back off, off the railing. Uh, the the Durgadin longsword, you know, swings next for a uh, 21 to hit. That's going to hit as well. Uh, for seven points of damage. Uh, you run this one through with your long sword. And do I have movement to be able to get to the third guy? Absolutely. You have whatever your normal movement is. Yeah, uh, it's a uh, 35. Yeah. Uh, so then that's going to be a 19 to hit. That is going to hit as well. And this is my follow up with the Warhammer for another seven points of damage. Your Warhammer comes down with a sickening thud and barely has this Sahugan's muscles untensed from landing on the deck. Then you have slain all slain all three of them. I, I uh, assisted. I mean, we, we got we, we know Fig did a, did a real damage. There's no well, as far as you guys know, <laughs> there was only three of them. You don't know how many Fig Fig did definitely hurt these ones, um, but. I don't remember the last time this has ever happened, if this has ever happened to me, but in the first person's turn of a round of combat, the entire combat encounter is over. But that is in big part to Fig's awesome uh, damage against these uh, Sahuagin. You see all around you uh, as you're all sort of getting your weapons ready. Fig is beginning to uh, kind of or, you know, realize that you're back up on the deck. Uh, you see some of the crew around you pulling out um, their short swords, daggers, and uh, uh, scimitars. Some of them, they don't even clear their sheaths. And Thorgarn just goes into a blur, taking these out, just wham, chop, And they just kind of look around and push, put their weapons away. And uh, everybody just sort of begins immediately to scan the horizon, watching the water, looking around. So in in this moment, Thorgarn's remembering, you know, being uh, being underground and the lack of anything he was able to do productive against the against the dragon. So he kind of feels, you know, a little uh, like, all right, I feel better about myself now. <laughs> Um, so Dervish actually comes running forward and he's sort of running along the starboard, um, the starboard rail and he keeps looking over, looking down and he's, he's looking around, looking at the dead, uh, Sahuagin and he's already barking orders at his men, get them off overboard now. And looking into the water, you can see eight more bodies just floating in the water where Fig had burst out of the water. Dervish comes over to you, Fig. Are you all right? Yes, the water did not get into many of the my crevices this time. Uh, well, I guess that's, uh, good. Uh, what, what happened? 
I, I mean, I know you went overboard, but, and well, I can guess why you sank, but how, how in any of the God's names did you manage to fall into the water directly into a swarm of Sahuagin? Perhaps the term you're looking for is luck, or the opposite, unluck. What did you see? Any more of them? I could not. It seems as though there was a large abyss. Abyss? Yes, that is a dark hole with, in which you could see no bottom. Immediately, Dervis runs back over to the edge, looking down, and you see him sort of squinting at the water. And he leans back over his shoulder and calls to uh, Quartermaster, depth gauge. And you see a crew member and the Quartermaster come running over, and and they have this uh, device that kind of looks like a weighted wing, and it's got a much thinner rope, but a lot of it, um, in a coil. And they begin to, uh, uncoil this rope really quickly and they drop it into the water. And I need to do a little bit of math since this was a random roll. Um, you watch as the quartermaster and this person who's actually stepped over the railing and is kind of on uh, where the rat lines come down. And um, they he's standing there and uh, kind of feeding this, this uh, rope as this thing is sinking and sinking and sinking. And the quartermaster is watching the rope itself. Um, where there are demarcations on and you can see that even though it's falling rapidly, she seems to be counting, just moving her lips a little bit as she's counting, uh, these demarcations on the rope. Um, after a f just a few s minutes, the descent slows and stops and she turns to captain dervish and she says, It's 135 fathoms. And that is where we're going to take a quick break because I just got word that Jeremy is ready to jump in. Um, so this is a perfect spot. It's a little bit early, earlier than we normally would take a break, but we're going to take uh, our usual break, I guess. <laughs> we'll just take it now. Uh, we're going to get Jeremy queued up and then we'll do what we got to do. So please first of all thank you to everybody who's tuned in thanks to the new followers and subscribers uh we love you and appreciate you it means a lot uh please stick around uh we have some promo stuff that runs during the during the break things you can learn about and um i'm just realizing i did not open up my timer because i want that running for you uh we're going to take about a 10 minute break we'll get jeremy in here and then we will Apparently, I can't do that. My computer is acting all kinds of weird. So no timer on the break. We just know that it's about 10 minutes. Uh, so please stay tuned. We will be back in 10 minutes. Hey, Internets, it's Jake from Mini Terrain Domain, and this is The Intermission. Mini Terrain Domain, or MTD, is a channel dedicated to the love of and participation in the world of tabletop role-playing games. Whether we're designing encounters or miniature terrain, building worlds or dice towers, or just playing games, everything we do here is because we love this amazing hobby. That is why the mission statement of Mini Terrain Domain is simply, imagine, build, play. If you like to watch live play or actual play D&D games, you can do so at twitch.tv slash mini terrain domain three days a week at 8 30 p.m eastern on sundays you can join us for chult 
of personality. A long-running campaign set in the Tomb of Annihilation uh, adventure setting. On Mondays, you can join us for All That Glitters, a Waterdeep Dragon Heist campaign guaranteed to be epic proportions. And every Thursday night, you can join us for Dawnbringers, The Forge of Fury. This is a series of mini campaigns uh, going across the gamut of several well-known modules. Season 1, which is available on YouTube.com slash mini terrain domain, took place in the Sunless Citadel. And Season 2 is currently taking place in the Forge of Fury. If you can't join us in the chat for our live shows, that's okay. You can usually catch the role play, or rather the replay, on YouTube just two days later. If you're a fan of what we do here and you like to support what we do, there are a variety of ways you can do this. First, simply follow the Twitch channel or hit the subscribe button on YouTube. Next, make sure you follow all of the participants of each game or show on their various social media platforms. To do this, if you're watching live with us on Twitch, you can simply type an exclamation point and that person's name into the Twitch chat or on YouTube, you can look down below the information bar and all of their links can be found there. Finally, if you would like to provide monetary support, which flows right back into the production of the channel, so we can continue making great content, you can join the growing list of patrons on Patreon. Additional, additionally, you can also use Ko-Fi or coffee to buy a coffee or two. I like coffee. But the absolute best way to support the channel is to follow and subscribe on Twitch and YouTube and join us in the chat. If you have an Amazon Prime account and you link it to your Twitch account, you can subscribe one channel per month absolutely free. No matter what you decide to do, we are just happy to have you here. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more great content in just a few moments. Remember, the Metadata! Hi everyone, I'm V and I have the YouTube channel, The Crafting Muse. Please be sure to go over there and check it out if you too would like to learn how to make some tabletop terrain, paint miniatures, as well as some game accessories. I'm always happy to have new subscribers over there. Learn the ways of the Game Master, the Dungeon Master, and delve into the minds of the players. If you're looking for adventure, excitement, thrills, and a dice rolling good time, grab the modules each month and play the campaign with your gaming group with quest givers DM Scotty and DMG. They're taking you on an epic journey through the role-playing experience every Friday. You're sure to get hooked on adventure. And we really liked the idea of creating adventures together, so we thought that'd be a lot of fun to share with you guys. I didn't think this kind of stuff would come out of my brain. <laughs> we are quest givers, and I'll see you in the next video. Adventure Mixtape, a music and adventure anthology, is a collection of four adventures for the fifth edition of the world's most popular role-playing game. The adventures are setting neutral and meant to be seamlessly dropped into any world that has a large seaside city and a jungle environment. With a bit of adaptation, the environments could be changed to suit any group. In Treaty of the Tiger King by Kelsey Dion of the Arcane Library, a distant king arrives at the city to negotiate the peaceful end of a war, but the mercenary guild has other insidious plans for him. Will the players be able to thwart assassination attempts against King Rami and help him negotiate circles of social intrigue in order to finally end the war?
In Madness of the Majestic Menagerie by Ken Brees of Berlin's Beard, the famous Majestic Menagerie draws hordes of visitors to the metropolis and cultural hub known since time immemorial as Splendor by the Sea. But now the gates of the famous zoo have been shut and the grand opening of the new section has been jeopardized by a spate of mysterious accidents and, it's whispered, grievous injuries due to uncontrollable creatures. Mr. Majestic seeks to hire investigators and troubleshooters who can keep a low profile to iron out any problems before the impending grand opening becomes a complete disaster. Do you have what it takes to uncover what's driving the madness that's befallen the Majestic Menagerie? In the Infernal Collection by Sharon Biswas. When an influential fashion designer is found dead days before a major fashion show, heroes are called in to solve the mystery, prevent any further destruction, and help the fashion house prepare for the show. Gorillas in Their Midst by Jacob W. Norman of Mini Terrain Domain is a pulp action adventure wrought with perilous challenges and high possibility of death. But what is adventure without danger? Of course, there is the lure of vast piles of unclaimed treasure and the accompanying fame that await those intrepid adventurers who would defy the odds and plunge into the heart of darkness. In this adventure, the characters will face raging river rapids, wicked waterfalls, poisonous plants, venomous vines, sinking sands, treacherous traps, and the vicious jungle demon itself Awakane Gori. Grab your satchels, fedoras, and bullwhips. Adventure awaits. The Adventure mixtape also comes with four original songs inspired by and written for the heroic adventures herein. This collection of music and story is something unique. We had no better word for it than mixtape. If you ever received a cassette, CD, or digital playlist curated to take you on a memorable journey, then you'll recognize what you find inside this volume. Also included in the Adventure Mixtape, courtesy of Kelsey Dion of the Arcane Library, are exclusive combat cards. Special cards that contain all of the items, monsters, and spellcasters found within these adventures to make running your adventure all the more easier. Adventure Mixtape, a music and adventure anthology, is available exclusively on DriveThroughRPG.com. Cryfall, once home to the most wondrous kingdom the world had ever known, lasted to nothing in just a fortnight. It is here that the fiends of hell walk among us. It is here where all things die. Welcome to Cryfall. Demon invaders roam the landscape and have conquered all. The world is a ravaged and wrathful wasteland where the old world lies buried beneath the blood and sand with its gods and its secrets. Water is fought over with blood and steel. Compatible with the fifth edition of the world's oldest fantasy role-playing game, this book contains all new character creation options, including all of the familiar classes with new aspects befitting the ravaged wastelands of Cryfall along with new backgrounds, subclasses, spells, feats, and so much more. New races will allow you to play as the Cursed Ash Elves, the Forsaken Humans, the Primordial Incarnate, the Proud Orcs, the Reptilian Suri, or the Infernal Blooded Tieflings. New game mechanics such as Blood, Grit, and Effort give your games an intense focus on lethality and survival. Numerous roll tables full of ideas to help bring your games to life. Featuring incredible thematic art by Brandish Gilhelm of Bluehammer Games, as well as Lloyd Collins. The people of Kryfoth are not heroes. In Kryfoth it is courage just to survive. Will you rise to face the tide of demons, or will you succumb to the hostile elements? Available now on DriveThroughRPG.com. And we're back. And it looks like we got our unconscious dwarf back. So, Jeremy, I don't know if somebody else filled you in. I don't believe you were even able to watch. So after whatever event that nobody still knows what happened yet, um, whatever event it was that caused the ship to vanish and reappear, Talmud was knocked unconscious and is currently lying in a pool of ale 
uh, an ale barrel slammed against him, hit him in the head, um, and knocked him unconscious. Uh, you actually would have taken one point of bludgeoning damage from that. Um, Griveth saw you lying there, looked like you were probably more stable on in the prone position and left you. Giselle, the quartermaster, has just told Captain Dervish that the depth is coming up at 135 fathoms, uh, which is about 800 feet. And he looks at her and he looks back and he looks at Fig. I don't know how sturdy that uh, that body of yours is, but uh, that's awful deep. You're lucky. You're lucky your friends were able to reel you in. Yes, I do believe that I would have been crushed to death. Oh, it looks like you got a. You might have gotten a bit of water in your. Well, whatever a voice box is. But otherwise, you don't seem to have fared too bad. Did You didn't see any more of those? The Sahuagin? Uh, no, no audio at all from you now, Megan. I did not. Well, I suppose that's something. Well, this is, uh, well, it's what we call a, what we call a blue hole. You never know where these things are going to be in the, in the, <laughs> knock it off the <laughs> inside joke. Uh, that in itself is a, a poor pun. Uh, at any rate, uh, I'm not going to tell you guys what that inside joke's about. Um, uh, poor Jeremy. I don't know. Oh no. He came in as we were talking about that. Anyway, that's what we call a blue hole. Uh, those things appear all over the place. You know, I don't know. You got a very small chance that you might find a, uh, an old shipwreck or a treasure cache down in those things, but more often than not, some creature of the deep's lurking down there. And as you guys have been <laughs> so, well, let's call it fortunate, since you're new to the seas here, to discover these seas are full of Sahuagin, or what we like to call the Sea Devils. Um, I would like... I'm going to have everybody roll a perception check, except for Cantriel. Uh, you're already going to notice this with your ungodly... What is it, 19 now, I think? Uh, passive perception? 18. 18? Yeah. I got a 4. Thorgarn doesn't notice anything. Talmud's unconscious. Uh, what about Fig and Fig? What'd you get? 12. Griveth? I got 11. So Cantrail's the only one that notices. Um, what you notice now is that and you only notice this because literally since you dealt with the other Sahuagin, it's only been um, maybe 10 minutes. The water here is brighter blue and less choppy than it was 10 minutes ago. The water was darker and choppier. The sky is cloudier than it was. The land that was so distant behind you to the east as you left the Sword Coast is no longer visible. In fact, there's no land visible anywhere. Uh, Captain Dervish. Uh, yeah. Actually, real quick, I do have to retcon something that in my brain... I'm surprised nobody's called me on this because I'm remembering it. The Sohugan Blade Master attack had happened after dinner and after sunset. So, oh, so it is dark. dark. Uh, so it'd be moonlight that was coming down through the water, not sunlight. Um, but the same is true as I, everything else that I said. Just retcon it that it's nighttime. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. What is it, Candrio? Well, we had some interesting uh, steering not too long ago, and now things look a little bit more different than <clears throat> they probably ought to, considering the time that's passed. What it... exactly happened? Well, <laughs> uh, I, well, that's sort of a neat little thing that I can that that the Evangeline can do. Uh, we we had a little bit of an extra boost getting the two of you involved, which thank you for that. Um, I although <laughs> it wasn't quite as effective as I thought it would be getting away from. We did get away from the Blade Masters, and there were sure to be more of them, you know, lurking in the area. Uh, but these seas are rife with those creatures. Uh, but we Next needed to time. get out of there. Next time you want a little boost, I do far better with forewarning. He sort of starts to say something and then cocks an eyebrow. <laughs> right, well, the situation uh, called for some quick thinking. Um, the good news is we are now only two or three days out from Salt Marsh. How did you shave that many days off our intended duration? Well, let's just say that we skipped a whole lot of ocean. You being magic users, um, perhaps are familiar with uh, certain spells that allow you to move rapidly from one point to another point. Teleportation. Have you heard of it? Uh, I've been known to do it myself, yes. Well, the Evangeline has the ability to travel up to... 10 days worth of distance in the blink of an eye. Hence you're saying eight. Right. We definitely don't want to make a jump like that so close to uh, the shoreline uh, or close to any shipping lanes. We took a big chance not charting before we jumped. Um, bad news is we're not going to be able to do that for quite a while. Uh, we jumped eight days, so it's going to be at least two ten days before we gain that travel ability back. Uh, but we do still have two days of travel uh, before we arrive at Salt Marsh. Maybe three, depending on the wind and the weather. Um, it looks like uh, you <laughs> made quite quick work of this uh situation here Thorgarn you're quite handy with those weapons I've been known to swing a weapon here or there I'm just uh, happy that we were able to get our companion back it's a long way down and he ain't exactly light well that's probably the biggest takeaway from this whole thing is you were able to get uh Get Fig back, so so that's good. Uh, Captain, you know, flattery aside, did you ever intend to tell us that this was a little trick your boat could do? Honestly, if I had my way, it's kind of like playing a game of poker. Uh, you don't necessarily just walk up to the table and lay all your cards face up. Um, so I hadn't intended on this. Uh, it's more of a thing we keep in reserve, but I also hadn't intended on running into Sahuagin Blade Masters off the Sword Coast. She'll walk right up to him and she'll poke him with her finger. You beat me to the punch, but I was going to pull out my longsword. <laughs> hey! Next time you want to play poker, I may not be so willing to help out you and your crew. I do far better knowing what's ahead of me and what's available to me. Not little surprises. All right. All right. That's fair. That's fair. Again. What? I'm sorry. Were you going to say something? 
I think Fig just pipes up. You can almost see him, like, over top of Cantrell's shoulder. Yeah, I see it. But uh, what is it? What do you want to see? Whatever you use to make the ship jump like this. That is quite a feat, and I would very much like to see it. Um, well, uh, yeah, yeah, I, and he kind of looks over at Cantriel, who I imagine is still just sort of giving him that look. I, absolutely, I'll explain to you what I know of the ship, what it can do. Uh, for a moment, we're going to cut over to while this conversation is happening. Talmud, you suddenly smell a very strong scent of ammonia in your nostrils and are jolted awake. (laughs) Oh, ah, did somebody piss somewhere? What is that smell? <laughs> Was it me? Um, kind of looks down. Uh, you're you're fortunate that you're completely <laughs> covered in ale, uh, so it's hard to tell if you pissed yourself. But it's not. Uh, let's not rule that out. And you see a um, middle-aged human woman uh, with dark hair pulled back. Uh, you would have in the in the time you've been up on the ship about a day, um, you would have already met her. Uh, this is Matilda, the ship's surgeon. It's the same one that I met below decks. Yeah, actually, I think I, that's right. You did meet you yeah. specifically met yeah. Matilda. She gave me something to uh, to help with the seasickness. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, this is going to sound like a line. It's not, I assure you. But we really have to stop meeting like this. It, I don't remember what happened. Exactly. That's nothing to be ashamed of. You're just, uh, well, you got hit in the head when we jumped. And you are unconscious. Did I miss any fighting? Eh, just a small amount, uh, but <laughs> I'm never going to live it down. Your dwarven cousin over there took care of it, and I no, think the, really I think the down. I think the metal man did something pretty impressive as well. Well, fig. Oh yes, a fig's full of surprises, and springs too. I think. <laughs> yeah, that's certainly a, a curious one indeed, but. You don't look to have much more than a bump on your head. Another one. You may have well, a headache. I that that happens when you're covered in ale, I find. Indeed. <laughs> Perhaps next time you'll drink some, though we're now a keg down. That's that may be the saddest part of this whole affair. <laughs> but I think you'll be all right. I've got to go check on the others. Well, I uh Thank you. That's literally my job. He kind of rolls over onto his all fours and kind of like slowly gets back up, kind of making sure that his legs are as under him as they're going to get being on the ocean. As you stand up, a slightly larger wave rolls under the keel and the ship sort of pitches and yaws. Straight back down to the deck. <laughs> back into the ale uh this is fine (laughs) i'm fine here as this is after or sort of as this moment is happening where uh talmud goes back down onto the deck uh dervish is leading um cantriel fig and griveth if you're coming thorgarn whoever's coming back towards the quarter deck and he's just sort of explaining the ship. <clears throat> well, I sort of lucked into the ship a couple of years ago. And over the course of 
a bit of time, I was able to convince Victor that I would be a much better steward of this ship and uh, be able to take help him to take care of the ship if we were to take it out to sea. Apparently, he had been guarding this ship in the harbors of Waterdeep in the docks for over 90 years. He would never let anybody near it, no matter who came to the ship. They would not be able to come on board. I was able to convince him it was in the best interest that the ship see some action, he would be first mate, and he could still protect the ship. In turn, he began to teach me some of the things this ship could do. Uh, it appears that the, well, you see the markings on the sails there, and I'm trying to remember who it was that learned the information. Was it Fig or Cantriel? Cantriel, you're the one, as a bard, who had heard the tales of the Vieros um, from a long time ago. And uh, he says, believe it or not, this ship used to belong to uh, Sylvain Aetherlock of the Vieros. Uh, a long time ago, adventuring party uh, that of some renown, though... The rumors have it that as the years passed and, and their stories began, began to become history lessons and whatnot, that uh, some of them went on to do not so good things. Uh, they had a, a cleric, I think, by the name of Hycinaroth. Uh Supposedly, he's... Well, been up to no good down into the southern deserts. Uh, but Sylvain, apparently, about close to 100 years ago, was an open lord, or uh, was a mass lord at Waterdeep. At least that's what Victor tells me, but eh, he's a spectator and spent 90 days, or 90 years on his ship in a dock, so... Sometimes I'm not too sure if he's even certain of his stories, but... What? Do either of those names ring a bell to me? The Hycenaroth or... Yeah. Uh, uh, anybody can make a history check. Uh, Cantriel, you already know from your previous check, having learned about the Vieros, that those are names. Hycenaroth was the cleric, and... Uh, you said cleric, so I, I was hoping it was religion. Uh, yeah, you could do a religion check. Isn't that his mark up on the uh, sail? Well, that's the mark of the Vieros. The blue markings on the sail are Sylvain, Aetherlocks. So that's symbol. a 13, so I'm going to guess no. Um, I'll say that it's enough. When it comes to these kind of checks, I do tiered. Uh, so based on how high you roll on the DC will determine how much you know. Uh, but 13 is enough for you to have at least be familiar with that name uh, that he was a cleric of some renown um, uh, over a hundred years ago uh, within the realm. So did any, who else did anybody else make any checks on those? Okay. Uh, so it turns out, and then he kind of stops for a moment as Matilda comes walking by and he looks past her and sees Talmud on his knees are you going to be all right? Oh, yes. Uh, I'm I'm fine. I just lost something. <laughs> right. Well, you're welcome to join the tour if you want. So is, oh. he, so is he still lying down, you know, in, in view? He's sort of on his hands and knees on the deck. W was it your lunch, cousin? Or your uh, dignity? <clears throat> he kind of, like, from this, like incredibly embarrassing position he kind of like turns and shoots like a look at Cantriel and then he kind of out of spite like tries to stand back up leaning on whatever's next to him <clears throat> I'm fine he kind of stumbles for a moment as the, the boat shifts again and he kind of overreacts you're right you look absolutely perfect totally yourself <clears throat> So, he kind of looks at the captain. 
Please continue. Talmud, you feel a presence behind you, and the others of you can see as the form of Victor the Spectator rises up from below decks and is now hovering. Uh, he is... The bulk of his body is probably... I think we said he's, he's close to... Um, like three or four feet, if I remember correctly. Uh, so he's, you know, he's a good round floating orb. Uh, you feel this form behind you, and then you feel the warm, uh, almost hot breath of Victor on the back of your neck, Telmud, as he attempts to whisper to you, It's all right, dwarf. It took me a while to find my sea legs, too. <laughs> sea legs <laughs> and one of his eye stalks sort of claps you on the back as if it were a hand clapping you on the back that's that's a comforting situation <laughs> uh, uh, Tomo turns around and says do you, do you have are you just like a big skull under there underwear inside your everything hmm. and he opens his mouth ridiculously wide and the four eye stalks sort of curl around and just go inside his mouth and you see them sort of moving around one of them starts to move towards his throat bumps his oh. uvula and you just see this all of a sudden next to you Victor, the spectator, just goes, <coughs> I'm very wet inside. Right, it's official. <laughs> I like this one. Uh, uh, right, Victor. Um, I was just showing him around the ship, showing him what she could do. He's got a good sense of humor. I think he's... Uh, Picked up a few things for me along the way. It's been a few years we've been together. Uh, he was not nearly as funny when I met him. Anyway, so the ship here, the Evangeline, is a merchant vessel. It's actually a carrot class sailing ship, a little bit smaller than some of your other sailing vessels, and you've noticed. Uh, perhaps that she's got a much smaller crew than would nor be normal for a ship of this size. Typically, you'd expect there to be about uh, 20 or 30 crew on board. But we get by with a standard crew of about 12 people, uh, plus the officers. Because the ship just sort of kind of takes care of things on its own. It's just always been that way. Uh, I probably sailed with Victor a good two years before he told me about that little trick with the gold bands on the ship's wheel. And that it took me another three months to figure out how to get it to actually work. Uh supposedly in a little bit of research that we've done Sylvain Aetherlock had an Enchiridion a book full of all of his adventures and his secrets and his lore and presumably included within that was the sort of instruction manual for this ship but nobody's ever been able to find that thing so a lot of it's just pushing at things pulling at things poking at things and Victor says, breaking a few things. Well, yeah, but those things were obviously not magical, and we were able to fix them. But for the most part, I mean, you've seen the big trick that she can do. Uh, aside from requiring very little maintenance and very little... Uh, she's a lot easier to sail than other ships, I'll say that. Uh, the crew doesn't have to work that hard to keep her afloat and moving in the direction we want her to go. Um, so we run cargo back and forth between different regions along the coast, 
occasionally back and forth between the Sword Coast and Keoland. Um, that's how I make my trade as a as a merchant. Well, well, Captain, I might you know might say that if you got access to a decent sized pearl, and uh, I might be able to, and I kind of wiggle my uh, little dwarven fingers, you know, do some magic and find some uh, some information about said ship. No promises. I don't know much. It's not something I've had a chance to to use yet. But... What do you need a pearl for? Well, you said you weren't certain how everything works on the ship, and there's there's magic. What I said was we weren't certain. Oh, okay. We've pretty much figured it all out now. All right, well, then never mind. But I appreciate your willingness to help. Don't get me wrong. So, looks like we've all had a very busy day. We need to plot out where we are exactly. I know roughly where we are, eight days in the direction we were heading. Uh, and to be clear, we have not traveled through time. Just in case you were thinking, you know, you lost eight days, don't worry about that. Some of these guys were, the first couple times we jumped, were worried that they were getting younger than their folks back home. But, uh... We just teleported the distance that we would have normally taken us eight days to travel. It's a very imprecise magic. Or precise. I guess I I don't really fully understand how it works. I just know that it works. At any rate, you may want to find yourselves uh, comfortable in your cabins for the night. Get rested up. By morning, we should have a good sense of where exactly we are. And be well on our way a day closer to salt marsh uh and he sort of tips his hat and uh turns to head towards his cabin along with uh this quartermaster um and his bosun and victor floating behind hey captain uh yes i'm sorry for uh snapping at you I I don't do well thinking that I might be losing someone I care about beyond my control. And she'll look over to Fig. He stops and he looks at you and you see him look over at Fig and then he kind of looks around at Griveth standing there in his tabard, his bare arms and and uh Thorgarn pretty much armed and armored to the teeth. Uh no no armor on the ship. I was told to take it off. So Oh, you took your armor off, but you still had all your weapons, you know, you're armed <laughs> to the teeth. <laughs> I got I got my weapon strapped across the back, couple still on the hip. Looking at Talmud, whose hair and beard are a bit uh sodden with ale, um and Talmud a bit queasier and whiter than normal, uh, paler, I should say, uh, and then looks back to you, Cantriel, and he al- he has that look, almost like he wants to say something, and he just kind of just gives you that nod of acceptance. I understand. Well, we've got business to tend to, and I suggest you all just get yourself some get yourself some sleep. Megan, it sounds like. Eli is drip pilot or is captaining the ship. I don't know why I slipped in the Eli all of a sudden. <laughs> uh, so the captain has headed with his officers to his cabin. Um, unless you have something else you would like to do or somebody you would like to talk to, uh, you can retire for the night and take a long rest. I think that um, during the night, um, Fig would be awake just jotting down notes. He would try and do just walk the ship in and on the back of the large book that he has. He's actually started to make his own notes. Um, and he's going to start writing about all the things that he can discover about 
uh, the chip and how it works. Okay. So, you as an automaton do not require sleep, do you? Okay. Um, so, I will have you... I'm going to have you make four checks for me as you are moving around the ship. Um, and then possibly a fifth, but we'll take it one thing at a time. Uh, so first, I'm going to have you make a... You can choose Investigation or Arcana um, as you are on the quarter deck and sort of looking at the ship's wheel. Um, that was the first thing that was directly indicated to you as having magical properties. I think he's going to use Arcana just because he's specifically looking for the magical source. Okay. I'm going to use a domain die. <laughs> <laughs> he really, I really want to. to... Okay. Uh... Oh, wait. Yeah, you can start 70 now. 22. Okay, uh, so your first stop, you look at the ship's wheel, and there are six total, <clears throat> excuse me, six total uh, of the rungs on this ship's wheel that have gold bands that are inlaid um, into the wood. And upon closer upon closer inspection you can actually see that there are very archaic magical runes very shallowly and intricately engraved into these bands um and with that high of a check and your arcane knowledge um you know that these runes directly relate to very advanced uh teleportation magic uh, so it seems to be pretty much what uh, uh, Sylvain said, kind of, or not Sylvain, um, Dervish said about the ship um, and uh, kind of confirming that teleportation magic is somehow being channeled through the entire ship and all those aboard it. I would like you to make a investigation check or the port side of the ship as you're checking around. That's a 13. <clears throat> okay. Uh, you're seeing, you know, there's still a few fragments. Uh, in fact, you see some of the crew are picking up, taking care of the broken uh, pieces of the um, barrel that broke against Talmud's head. Um, one of the crew members has a couple of tools on a on a leather belt and is uh, trying to salvage the rings and a couple of the unbroken slats from the barrel. Um, and uh, he's the ship's cooper, uh, the keeper of the keeper and maker of the barrels and general carpentry. And uh, yeah, he's just salvaging what he can of it, uh, cursing a little bit under his breath. <laughs> Um, and even, uh, just at one point you see him, uh, he has like a, uh, a, a, lin a linen, uh, like cravat around his neck and he presses it down into a spot where the ale is pooling and just holds it up and kind of sucks some of the ale out of it. It's a shame to waste good ale. Uh, progressing forward to the fore of the ship, to the bow. Make me another investigation check. Uh, that's a dirty 20. <clears throat> so on the bow of this ship, it was already established that there was a uh, ballista mounted center deck in front of the foremast um, that seems to cover almost 180 degrees in each direction. Um but you also notice that along the gunnels on the fore of the ship, there are these, uh, there's ropes, 
There's what almost looks like spare canvas for sale. And you see the edge of a box sort of sticking out. It's long and um, seems to almost be uh, deliberately covered up by the sails and the ropes and stuff. Um, as if the way the sail is up, the canvas is laying there was intended to hide the fact that there's even a box there. Um, but in all of the commotion, it appears to have been turned up a little bit and you spot the edge of it. If it could not resist such an anything on this, on such an interesting boat, a boat. So he is going to look. So you pull aside the canvas and the ropes. It takes just a few minutes to kind of un- untangle everything, move it aside. Uh, and actually what you realize is as you start to kind of try to untangle this rope and stuff, you realize it's not tangled. It's just made to look tangled. And as you start to pull in where that corner was exposed, you realize this whole thing moves easily out of the way, uncovering this box. Um the whole thing is almost a facade. This box is about 18 inches by 18 inches and about six feet long. And you can see the lid. Once you get everything clear of it, you see the lid. It's not latched. It's not locked. Um, you're able to open it up. And inside you see what looks like a long about four foot long cannon barrel and mounting hardware for mounting it to the railing but this cannon does not have a traditional cannon shape it has where the opening of the cannon of the barrel is it's carved and shaped to look like a dragon's head Uh, do I see any sort of ammunition in this? Strangely, there is no ammunition. There is only the mounting hardware. In fact, looking at... So as you're looking at this thing sitting in this compartment, it's sort of like uh, the top of the dragon's head is pointing up, so its mouth is open to your left. And to the right, at the butt of the cannon, you would expect there to be some kind of a hole for fuse or something like that. There's not. Instead, what you see are gold bands with runes etched into them. Uh, do Am I able to recognize the runes? You will need to give me another arcana check for that. Okay. That is a 16. You definitely recognize that they are arcane runes, and they have a very, very much a similarity to, to uh, as if the same wizard or artisan or both uh, managed these runes as the ship's wheel. But you can't quite decipher what kind of magic it is uh, with that check. Um, I need to actually check something real quick while you're doing this. Um, Did everybody else pretty much just go to bed? I just wanted to make sure that, you know, my my rope and, you know, hammer were were retrieved. Yeah, you're absolutely able to retrieve that. Um, So, being that late, it's just going to be the watch. Um. All right. So, unable to decipher the runes. Do you? What do you do, Fig? Fig would, um, write it down. Everything he can see in his little book that he has, and he would even do a rough sketch, though he's no artist, and it looks very straight and and, and awkward. I would imagine. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You're able to sort of sketch out the the basic shape and style of the cannon. 
uh, make some annotations of what some of these runes are. Um, do you close the lid, cover the box back up? Do you? No. Um, I know that he would, yeah, he would cover the box and put everything over. So you cover, you put, you close the lid, you move the canvas and ropes and everything and sort of put it back into the shape. It seems to almost like be shaped to fit over and conceal this box and you kind of fit it back into position, give it a last pat and you stand up and you turn around and leaning against the foremast is one of the crew members. You see bright embers as he takes a drag on a hand rolled cigarillo. You know, it's not entirely what you would call polite to go into somebody's ship and snoop around their uh, head and bits. But it is not hidden. It is right there. I'm not aware of many of the ship's customs, as your captain was quite willing to show us everything else. The captain showed you what he wanted to show you. If he'd have mm. wanted you to see this, I think he'd have shown it to you. Mm. Well, I, I suppose I also don't expect him to show us every other crate and what is in there. Hmm. I am just looking. I don't know what you are. But maybe you should go down with the rest of your friends below the deck into the room that we've given up for you and sleep or lay there staring at the ceiling or doodling in your book, whatever it is you do, and leave what's hidden underneath tarps hidden underneath tarps. Trust us. If these things be needing using, we know what we need to do. I sense unnecessary hostility in your voice. He exhales. I am no he exhales, blowing smoke into your face. You think? You're snooping around in my house, poking this around in my house. hidden bits. Oh, I live here. I expect that house would have many different definitions then. I shall make note of that. Is this not also your job? I eat here, I sleep here, I live here. This is my house, this is my job, this is my livelihood. I see. You lot seem to barely understand how to move around on a ship. You are on, on board this vessel, not even a full day, and you went overboard. That is what make, that makes you what we like to call a landlubber. Hmm. I feel like you are trying to hurt my feelings. Shame, I feel like we could have had a very good conversation. I think this conversation is over, and I'd like to see you moving back below decks to your quarters. Very well. I shall see you later. I will stay here out a bit longer. And he would just turn to leave. <laughs> All right. Well, as you move around, you see that this uh, shipmate, this crew member, keeps you in eyesight. If you stay on deck any longer... He's going to be watching you, whatever you do. You're welcome to continue investigating if you wish, but he is watching you. He would. He would pay no mind. He is rather unbothered by any of that. All right. Uh, give me another investigation check. That is a 16. You actually, um, oh, wait, there was one more check I wanted you to make. Make one more. As you move around to the starboard side, or yeah, port starboard, I don't remember. 
Opposite of where you were. Uh, that's a 15. <clears throat> uh, you don't uncover any other hidden containers or anything like that. Uh, a lot of it just, it seems like maybe pulling at a tarp or some canvas or some rope or some barrels or buckets, whatever. Everything seems to be um, tied down deliberately just to keep it from rolling around the ship, uh, but seems to be legitimate pieces of equipment, spare rope, um, things like that. Um, the last check I would have you make is if you go below jet decks to do any investigating or do you go to your room? No, he would go to the, his, uh, he would go continue wandering around. Uh, I can imagine too, as he leaves the top deck to go to the bottom deck, he just turns to that sailor watching him and just gives him a curt wave and goes downstairs. All you see in response is the brightening of the ash at the end of his, uh, cigarillo as, and you see his face sort of illuminated in the glow of the embers of the cigarillo. And then you disappear below decks. And you said you are going to snoop around more. Not snoop. He's not going to like go into any. (laughs) You say you're not snooping, but (laughs) he is. Fig is a beast of curiosity and he is driven absolutely by it. So the question (laughs) is, the question is for, oh, there we go. Uh, So your quarters are on the lower deck at the stern of the ship. There is another hold below deck where uh, you already sort of know that in the lower deck is, uh, like I said, your your quarters, there's some uh, uh, some crates and bales and things like that. And there is a privy located at the uh, stern of the ship. Um, there is a hold below. You do know that um, a lot of the, uh, um, or rather all of the dwarven miners are below deck in the hold um, in hammocks. Uh, beyond that, you don't know what's down there. He would go down there just staying away more for the sake of disturbing anyone who is sleeping, but he he would. <laughs> okay. So, Fig, if you're trying not to wake any dwarves, as you step down even lower into this lower hold, you emerge into an area where there are a few crates and barrels and stuff pushed up against the walls. Uh, this area of the hold is actually about 20 feet across and about 40 feet long. As soon as you come down the stairs, there is a closed door in front of you at the bow of the ship, and there is another closed door at the stern of the ship. You can hear the sort of creaking below decks of the ship. You can hear the water splashing up against. Uh, At this level, you're actually below the water line a bit. Um... And you can hear the water kind of slamming up against the side a bit as the ship moves through the water. Uh, you hear the creaking as hammocks, about um, 30 hammocks are swaying back and forth, full of the dwarves and a couple empty ones. Um, and this room is filled with a uh, discordant chorus of dwarven snores. Um, if you're going to try not to wake anybody, I would like you to make a stealth check at advantage because of the snoring. (laughs) Right. That's a dirty 20. You are able to move around here very quietly. Uh, what would you like to check specifically? Just, (laughs) um, anything that looks interesting to him uh you know any books or or any crates <laughs> okay uh give me an investigation check okay that is a 19 okay uh looking around 
you find um, that uh, there is where is this let me just double check something real quick so the first thing that you find with that is the locked door that's directly in front of you um, there is a uh, small very small like about eight inches square uh, barred window in the door and on the other side of it you can see that uh, this appears to be the ship's armory um, there are harpoons swords armor um, repair kits maintenance kits uh, things like that all stored neatly in racks tied up strapped up against the sides things like that Um, if you move on and continue exploring elsewhere, you can give me another investigation check unless you want to explore this room further. It is locked. No, he wouldn't. He wouldn't push anything that's that's locked. Um, uh, that is a 17. Or sorry, 16. You make your way with that uh, dirty 20 I think you had. On your stealth, um, you make your way to the stern through the swing, snoring dwarves, and there is another locked door. This door appears to be just as um, old as the rest of the ship's wood, um, but the lock on the door is gold the same gold that you have seen on the uh cannon and on the ship's wheel Ooh. oh no <laughs> i need an arcana check if you want to look closer at it yes uh that i'm going to use a domain die that is a uh, 23. <laughs> now, this next question is very important. Does Fig look with his eyes or does he look with his hands? His eyes. <laughs> <laughs> uh so basically what you see looking closer at this is you do see that there are runes etched in there and you can actually read these runes and these runes actually are not a magical incantation uh you actually see etched into the gold around the lock forming around the lock itself is um the symbol of the Vieros. And etched around it is the name Aetherlock. What would you like to do? Fig has no experience with breaking into places or unlocking locks. He is not confident in his abilities to do that. Um and so he will go in he will return back to the beds uh, where they had given them to sleep and wait until someone wakes up one of his companions when, wakes up in the morning to talk with them all right <clears throat> so I mean that would be Cantriel because she needs only four hours <laughs> so you absolutely fig along with everybody else get the advantage of the uh, long rest uh, you just took longer <laughs> to get to your room um all your exploring, I'll say, uh, and with trying to be quiet, probably you probably spent a good couple hours uh, moving through the ship and just poking and prodding. And um, as you go up to uh, go to your quarters, you do. No, nope, you wouldn't. Never mind. Uh, so you get to your quarters just fine, and you go and wait in there. Um, Morning comes and you all, uh, Cantriel's, as she said, probably the first to, to awaken. <laughs> um, but 
yeah, morning comes, the sun uh, begins to shine through. Your quarters actually have portholes, um, so the sun would begin to shine through into your rooms, um, and you are welcome to uh, move up deck uh, or see what you want to do. Are we all sleeping in the same room? No, you have individual rooms in the uh, in in special uh, guest quarters um, <clears throat> that you get the sense probably belonged to at least some of these rooms may have belonged to the crew or officers. So once he <clears throat> kind of decides <throat> that it's getting to morning, he's going to pace up and down the hall. Is there a hall that connects all of these doors? Because he's going to pace. So hall. it's basically what you have is this sort of the rooms move around the stern of the ship in kind of a U shape. And in this sort of uh, alcove, if you will, um, the uh, mizzen mast, uh, which is the mast at the rear of the ship, actually comes through. So I imagine Fig sort of just walking circles pacing uh so you guys would probably eventually hear this sort of can't drill would stick her head out right away fig you are awake uh, of course i'm awake obviously i'm standing here saying your name is everything all right uh y yes good morning um I believe they are hiding things here. Do you now? It has come to my attention that that may be the case. And there was some crew member with an extremely low intelligence who thought that he would resort, he would resort to mocking me to try and evoke my emotions, I think. Did, did he now? Any more of a description of this one, by any chance? Hmm. Uh, he was smoking some sort of cigarette, but that is in the matter. Um, I found some things, locked doors, that I would like to get in. <laughs> um. <laughs> Sorry. Don't mind me, just continue along as I make some notes. Hey, normally locked doors means you shouldn't be going in there. I'm hoping this was done under the cover of night, not recently. It was recently, as in it was before this morning, which was the night, so yes. Right. Was this before or after the troublesome crewmate? Uh, it was during. He f I found something that he was not very happy that I found. Even though it was quite obvious Right. Uh, something tells me we might need a little meeting with the rest of us if you've come across some uh, new information that might be of value for us all to know. I just do not understand. If we are guests, there should not be anything that they are hiding from us, especially something so interesting as magic. All right. Yes. Uh, come with me, Fig, and she'll take him by the hand, and she's just going to, like, start, like, not even knocking on doors because this is Cantriel. She's basically going in and she's like pulling up covers and be like, all right, time to get up. Let's go. Meeting time. Wakey, wakey, gentlemen. In Wait. each room. You, you go into Grivis' room and pull off his covers? Yep. She's taking that risk. Fig is in hand, though. Fig is in hand. So Cantriel just... <laughs> and Fig in tow have just come around and are waking all of you up. Oh, uh, we're get, not there yet. Get up, dwarf. Oh. So wakey, I'll, wakey. I'll say when, uh, when, when you come into Thorgarn's room, he's actually, you know, dressed and in prayer, uh, who, you know, saved some embarrassment there, but you can still see the, uh, you know, the uh, whatever, whatever, you know, remaining, uh, you know, leftover wounds from the slashes you received from the blade masters yesterday that, you know, for the most part, they're healed. But, you know, we're adventurers, you know, that kind of stuff is, is expected. 
Uh, all right, well, I guess I'll have to finish that later. What's, uh, what's going on? First of all, next time, tell me I can help you with that one. Secondly, Fig found out some interesting information we all need to hear. Okay. Group meeting. So be it. Excellent. And she'll whir out of the room. <clears throat> Where are you guys meeting? Back in Cantrell's room. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then, yes, she'd have to go to Grimace's room. <laughs> Griffith, get up. <laughs> wake up, wake up, wake up. Uh, what? What? We have information that needs to be shared. It's time for you to get up, get dressed, and meet back in my room immediately. Oh, yeah, in your room. All right. With the rest. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the rest of the party. Okay. Correct. All Not right. The type of party you're hoping for, dear. <laughs> Talmud walks past well, the open door to Grimace's right room. Now. It's too early for this. It's always too early for this. <laughs> and she'll glare at Grimace and storm back out. <laughs> Should I put all my clothes on? Dear God. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's, it's your guys' meeting. Have at it. <laughs> all right. All right, we all hastily dress. So what's going on? Well, it seems that uh, Fig here took a nice little um, self-guided tour of the ship. Mm. Did, she get, did, did he get into trouble? Uh, he, she'll look at Fig. Well, he seemed to have uh, encountered someone who smokes something, you said? Yes. Uh, it was quite fragrant, and I'm not sure he. So he was trying what? to get a rise out of me, and he told me to go back to sleep or something. So, so, so why were you poking around? I feel like anyone would be. It's, this is a very, very interesting ship. It's full of magic. You do not see that we teleported. That's fascinating. Uh, and, and that's what, what caused you to go overboard. Um, you, you, you know it's not our ship, right? We're here because we're doing a mission. Right, but it's information. Should information not be available to anyone? Um, we're, we are guests on this ship. We don't have the right to snoop around. Yes, but it's also fig. We didn't we exactly need, explain need, that to him, did we? Big, what's right and wrong. But we didn't tell him that, did we? But we did that down in the dungeon, did we not? We did not ask. <laughs> she's just guess. She's just like, ta da! <laughs> we did not ask guess. <laughs> we, we, were, we were trying to restore the, the clan's holding back to them. The orcs and other things had chased the dwarves out many years ago. Whereas you know, the, the, the man who, who created you, he had a, a house, right? Yes. So if he were to invite uh, Talmud here to come into the house, should Talmud be able to just wander around and touch whatever he wants? I don't know that Talmud would be able to come since it was under a hundred feet of water. <laughs> I, well, feel it, but I was trying to acquire knowledge. So it's pretty much you should ask, and whatever they're willing to say, that's you know what we have to accept. Hmm, that does not seem fair. True, but. You know, if we walk into town and somebody sees and I, you know, kind of tap the, uh, uh, you know, the Durgan and Longsword that we acquired uh, at, you know, at, at the stronghold, you know, if somebody sees Durgan's mark on there, uh, should they just, you know, like, oh, I want to look at that and start taking it off of my back? 
Does that seem right. so let me let me explain this. Let me explain it. Okay. But I wasn't going to take anything. I was just looking. They don't know that. But I told them that I wasn't. Shouldn't they believe me? <laughs> they should. That does not mean that they will. I found a very, very interesting looking cannon. Would you like to see? Um, and he's going to take yeah. a picture, take his book out and show the picture. Oh, thank heavens you didn't go after it. Well, that is that is interesting. Um, do I have any idea what a cannon is, Jake? Not having proficiency with water vehicles? Uh, make a history check. <laughs> <laughs> I the funny part is you've probably made the most history checks of anybody. <laughs> <laughs> At least it's not a negative uh you know on my checks, but you know the amount of history checks is ridiculous. Um yeah, it's a five. I, I'm gonna say no. Nope. Uh I, I, don't, I don't know what that cylinder is. You say cannon. Um I like the dragon part at the top. You see, it's usually something that projects, well, um, ammo or projectiles out. But it, if you see here, and he he starts like this whole kind of lesson on like why this thing is different. But then he also goes into, um, and then I found a door that was locked. And I didn't go inside because I don't know how to open locks. But uh, on it was gold, and on it it said uh, Aether Lock. Um, well, when things are locked, typically it's you know best to just leave them be, especially when they belong to somebody else. Usually, unless orcs took them first, then we go and kill them and take it back. Yes. Technicalities. There's a few that get thrown into the mix. Very complicated. But. Uh, didn't uh, Dervish take this boat from somebody else? So would we... Again, te technicality. Um... Did, he, did he take it or did he buy it? <sighs> well, I don't think he bought it. Uh, just based from his story? Uh, when, when he talks sometimes, I just kind of kind of wonder. He's... He's a bit long-winded, that one. We gotta get this right. We're just confusing this. For now, Fig, we want to remain friends with the captain. That's why we don't go into his, his things without permission. The Oryx, we didn't care. We didn't want to stay friends with them, so it was okay to steal all of their stuff. But that's not saying that we go and kill them when we stop liking them right now, because we're on a ship. Well, we're on a ship! No, no, we don't kill the people who know how to operate this thing. No. We don't kill yeah. good people. Well, we, that too. We don't kill good people. Unless they turn out to be bad. Well, they're they're not, they're oh, dear God, we're going to end at the bottom of the ocean. So I should ask him if he can open up the locked door for me. Oh. Um, maybe in not such Kendrick, a right way. I, I imagine Catherine asking would go a lot better. Um, well, chances are so, yes. So I would, I would say... No, now that we're underway, may, maybe we ask for a tour, and whatever he's willing to show us might be a better way of doing things. Well, I'm more than happy to ask for a personal tour. For, the, for the group. It might be more effective if it's just one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> Are you, uh, you still still going down that road? Things seemed a little, little heated yesterday. Well, it's not like I'm known for an even temper. Oh, hi, that's true. Which you know, you seemed uh, seemed busy last night. Uh, I wanted to say, Fig, I'm very worried when you went overboard. Happy to see that we were able to pull you back in. What, what did you see down there? Ah, uh, yes. Thank you for that. I feared that I would perish down there. Not much. Sea floor, very familiar. But uh, just a large hole. 
was quite deep. I could not see anywhere close to the bottom. And that is where those things came out. Mm. Well, uh, I'm, I'm assuming the ones that uh, the bodies floated to the top of the water were uh, you know, slain by your spell? Yes, I believe so. They were coming at me quite quick. No, you, uh, you thought fast. You did a good job. Thank you. And thank you for saving me. I appreciate it. We're glad to still have you with us, Fig. Indeed. Maybe some of us more than others, but I have a feeling it's safe to say all this time. We're the Dawnbringers. We look after each other. Gantrio's going to look at Griffin like, where the hell did that come from? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So, Fig, for now, can... Can we keep our uh, our curiosity down a little bit and see what information Cantriel is able to acquire? Pose. But if that doesn't work, maybe perhaps I could share a bit of my knowledge with him in exchange for his knowledge. And he's like looking from person to person just to gauge their reaction and just holding his book. Haven't you heard the old adage, curiosity killed the goblin? Uh, no, it was cat, and you're looking to barter, right? <laughs> uh, you're more than willing to try, but I, I doubt something like that is going to be met with uh, open arms and friendly smiles. And information is, to a lot of people, more valuable than coin. all quite confusing. It never really hurts to ask, honestly. I think Uh, knowledge is overrated, personally. Of course you would. Yes, but you tend to, you know, think with your your hammer first. (laughs) That's the truth. You can see that... You can see that Fag is kind of, he looks kind of defeated a little bit. His shoulders are a little slumped. And he's just looking at his book, at his at the drawings that he did and the writings that he took from the night before. So uh, how you feeling this morning, cousin? Better. Uh, the, uh, the, the ship's surgeon gave me uh, something. It was vegetables. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> So some some random person said, "Here, eat this," and you just kind of did so. I I wouldn't really call her random. We've talked with one another. Oh, she's not random then. Ooh, it's it was a she, huh? Huh? What? My, the tables are turning, aren't they? I did notice. <sighs> There's no interest there at all. Oh, of course not. Never ever. Cantriel's enjoying this way too much, by the way. <laughs> He kind of like blusters. <laughs> I'm going over this way. He just walks out of the room. Hmm. So normally, sorry. when they leave in a huff, that means there's something going on. Do you, Do you know who it was he talked to? Perhaps. Uh, perhaps there could be more conversation here. Well, there was that figure standing next to him when we were going down. After the captain, he was going to show us things. Hmm. I have to get some information here. I would say that you guys probably would have, you would know or have been introduced to the primary uh, ship's officers or, um, so you know, of course, Victor, the spectator, is the first mate. You've met Arnold, the bosun, Giselle, the quartermaster, Matilda, the surgeon who tended to Talmud, and Roland, the cook. So what what do we know about Matilda? She's a middle-aged human woman and okay, she's the ship we... surgeon. All right. I thought maybe with the the voice that you had you were giving her that there was you know dwarf there, but alas, I was wrong. No, it was actually leaning a little more into uh um a bad approximation of Irish. 
Ah, uh, okay. Dwarf takes so many different, you know, turns depending upon who's playing them. So it was a, uh, it was my West Michigan, uh, North American nasal tone trying to do an Irish woman voice. So it tends to come out a bit like this. All right. Well, now I have a, I've got a new mission. I got two, day, two days on the water. Right. So, do you understand what we're trying to tell you? But humans and other people are very confusing. That they don't like to tell information because reasons. And I cannot go into locked doors anymore. Bravo. Fig is learning. Fig is learning. Excellent. Well, now it seems we uh, we have some new things to do over the next couple days. And she'll she'll turn and reel towards Griffith. And don't you think that this morning is giving you any permission about anything further? This was important. Mm. Mm -hmm. That means you can get out now. Oh. <laughs> okay, he turns and leaves. He's going to look for Talmud. Uh, hey, Talmud. You hear a uh, whistle coming from Wait, that above that. Yeah. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> well, that wasn't me, my mouth. Oh, it's they're calling Scotty. <laughs> I thought you just like super stealthily like had the whistle like, behind your microphone. <laughs> I, I wish I had a boat swains <laughs> call. Uh, no, but you do hear a, uh, a boat swains, and you would have heard this whistle um, more than once on the ship because um, you you have spent now about a day in travel, <clears throat> and it's enough. Uh, generally, when the whistle sounded. Uh, it means that everybody should come to the deck. Um, typically, it's referring to the crew. Um, so uh, you're welcome to heed it or continue your conversation. What does Talmud do? So Talmud is, um, he's kind of turning to where this whistle has come from. Maybe do you, do you think we should should we, should we go? Probably I can t I can talk to you later. It's just about your cousin and Cantriel. Oh. Don't even get me started. <laughs> He'll kind of put his arm on like Griffith's shoulder and like lead him towards where this whistle's being sounded. It's probably more on my hip. <laughs> yeah, probably. Because I'm like six five. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, he probably like reaches up for the shoulder and then <laughs> yeah. like, no, nope, that's he just pats you on the arm. All right, let's head up and see what's going on. All right, maybe one of those fish people. Ugh. You all head up deck. Um, you end up on the on the main deck, and it is in fact a bright sunny day. There is a warm. Uh, wind blowing uh, the sails are in full bluster uh, you see the crew moving around taking care of things but they're nowhere near at excuse me as the captain said the ship doesn't seem to require as many hands or as much effort to control everything um, so you know somebody will move something or t tie a thing to a thing uh, you know ship's terms um, this is how you guys see it none of you have sailing experience so I'm narrating in your perspective uh, as somebody ties a thing to a thing and then that thing over there gets moved and somebody else pulls something. And um, But as you come up top, you can see that some of the crew are, and even a few of the, the Dwarven miners have, have made their way up deck. Um, 
just to get up out of the hold. Uh, a couple of them are still being sick. They're just not taking to the sea very well. Um, but you can see off the starboard bow, um, just about maybe a thousand feet or a thousand meters rather um there it almost looks like a ship but you see a bow and you see the bow sprit and then you see another bow and another bow sprit pointing in a different direction you see one two three five seven eight Ten masts rising up out of this thing, but at some of them at weird angles. And the ship is already turning to starboard, angling towards this. And you can see that Captain Dervish is uh, up on the quarter deck. One of the crew is steering the ship, and he has a spyglass out and is just looking in the direction of this thing and kind of leans over and says something to the crew crew member that's steering um and then he uh looks down on the deck and he sees that all of you are there ah good morning to y'all and he comes walking down the steps to you looks like we're in luck in the night we were able to plot our course figure out exactly where we are we are as of right now a little over a day of sailing from salt marsh itself thank the gods but first we're gonna make a stop off there that Are these ships dangerous well no maybe once upon a time what you see there is called saltwater sanctuary it is a sort of almost like an island that maneuvers through the sea um and is a place for ships to moor um i've been away from salt marsh for well over a month uh thank you quinian for the quinian senses that you may need domain dice uh thank you for the bits as we get another domain day there it is um i've been away for a little over a month and before we sail into the harbor at salt marsh i want to talk to mother pearl and just find out what's been going on in the region make sure there haven't been any weird political swings or power plays before we just sail into the unknown it's a bit of a the saltwater sanctuary is a bit of a floating uh inn tavern marketplace information can be bought and sold there uh you all might want to watch yourselves a little bit that you don't get taken advantage of but it's kind of a a neutral ground if you will nobody nobody draws weapons if there is to be any disagreements that reach a physical nature, they are handled with your fists. And Mother of Pearl will absolutely not tolerate magic used in her establishment. You've been warned. And he actually says all of these things out loud, loud enough for the dwarves around, wandering around. And as you get closer, the whole time he's been talking, the ship's been sailing closer to this place known as the Saltwater Sanctuary. And as you get closer, it just keeps growing in size. This thing, you can see at least seven holes, the bows of seven different ships. You see planking, you see um the stern castles of a couple ships uh some of them are stacked higher than others this whole thing appears to be multiple ships of different types 
held together by who knows what. You see ropes and lashings and canvas. You see all of these masts, some of them towering, some of them splintered and broken. There's rigging, rat lines. You see that there are actual sails that are unfurled, top sails and, and main sails uh, that look like they may be operational. You see high up, not one or two, but six different crow's nests with people up in them keeping an eye out. And you, as you grow closer, you can see that there are at least six anchor lines hanging off the edges of this thing, mooring it into its current location. Docks extend outward 50, 100 feet in multiple directions. This thing appears to be massive. It looks like it could handle the crews of several vessels at once. It's almost like a small floating village. The Evangeline is brought up alongside one of these floating docks and some of the dock, uh, some workers on the dock come moving forward and they grab some of the mooring lines and tie the ship off. And before long, the ship is docked at the Saltwater Sanctuary. The gangplank is lowered and Dervish looks at you all and says, well, it's up to you if you want to come with. I'm heading in to talk to Mother of Pearl. You're more than welcome to join me, and I will introduce you. Uh, and then he turns to Victor. Why don't you stay with the ship and keep an eye on it? Victor turns and looks over at Talmud. He says that to me every time. He knows I stay on this ship. Keep an eye on it. I know well, what he's doing. You... Oh. Uh, Talmud is already like halfway off the boat. Like behind the captain at this point. <laughs> Don't worry, guys. I've been practicing my spells so I can cast them without anybody knowing. Now, oh. I know usually they're kind of flashy and light shines and explodes and everything, but I've been practicing. So if I do need to cast magic, they'll never know. Don't worry about it. Oh, crap. That means I need to go now. <laughs> so, so, so no magic, no weapons? Is that what I heard? No, you... Well... It's not that you... You're probably better. He kind of looks at you, and like you said, you're armed to the teeth, and he goes, yeah, you might be better off leaving those things behind. So I go and, you know, put the things in my in my room... And you would like... you would actually notice that he is not wearing his twin scimitars. Do our rooms have lock and key? Uh, they do not. <sighs> close the close the door. Not really happy about leaving all that stuff behind. Off I go. Is does anybody not? go with dervish and a couple of the crew members go as well uh, a couple of the officers and uh some of the crew stay behind just to take care of some things but is there anybody else that or is there any of you that will not go they're all like hell yeah i'm going <laughs> all right so you walk down the gangplank and you begin walking as you're walking along the dock, uh, Talmud. The dock is a little bit of got a little bit of this motion, but once you get off the dock and sort of step onto the uh, wooden gangplanks that move around this place, the thing seems pretty solid. There's a very subtle, gentle motion to it, um, but it's not really disturbing in any way. You see from all manner of up close, this thing definitely looks like it's just jammed together, fastened together from different uh, pieces of ships. And um, it's sort of the, well, it's the, uh, uh, the burrow from Harry Potter <laughs> in ship form. It just looks like it's been just jammed together, uh, the Weasley's home. Um, 
you as you're walking along you see from like portholes and windows and sometimes just broken boards eyes staring at you watching you mostly humanoid or all humanoid mostly human a few dwarves elves um halflings you even see a couple of hobgoblins goblins bugbears some people are moving around everybody stops to look a few of them give nods curt nods to dervish dervish just sort of looks around nodding at different people walks around the perimeter until he gets to a set of gangplanks that leads inwards a little ways and you see what looks like the side of a ship that somebody has taken and built an archway into it and there's large oversized swinging doors like on a saloon and he walks in and it takes a moment as you all walk in behind him for your eyes to just make that adjustment from the bright sun to the dingy dark and as your eyes are making the transition you hear dervish say mother of pearl it's been a while it's good to see you and you hear a voice from across the tavern virgil dervish it's a pleasure to see you again <laughs> the sea ain't claimed you yet has it and as your eyes adjust you see in the center of this tavern is sort of a the bar is in the center it's all the way around the bar has a diameter of about 30 feet there's a few quite a few sailors and patrons all around this bar and tables everywhere this place is huge probably 60 feet across there are many many tables in here there are pieces of masts and boards jammed up holding things up in different places the whole thing has that sort of gentle creaking sound of a ship at sea uh, that you are becoming newly accustomed to but all of that pales in comparison to mother of pearl the bartender in the center of the tavern where you see about eight feet across floating in the air a pale blue beholder mother of pearl has 10 eye stalks that are peering all around in different directions some of them are wrapping like tentacles around glasses pouring bottles the most notable thing about this pale blue beholder is two things actually one her central eye is completely covered by a stitched black eye patch and she has no teeth in her mouth whatsoever and that is where we are going to end tonight's session I thought it was so funny before we went on the air that both Ted and V were talking, or and Scotty uh, were talking about uh, beholders. Uh, there was quite a discussion for about ten minutes before we played about beholders, and I'm like, I'm not saying a thing. I'm just gonna keep my mouth closed. <laughs> but one of the things Ted said was beholders are always so interesting because you can just do non-traditional stuff with them, and I'm like, yep. <laughs> well uh i had a lot of fun tonight i hope you guys did too uh it's definitely different not having a dungeon that you know you have to immediately go into and start clearing uh like i said when we started uh this ghost of salt marsh campaign uh season it's uh sort of a limited sandbox so a lot of it is i'm letting the players here drive the story and what happens i'm using a lot of the random roll tables and things in um the book so and as some of you may have may be familiar from previous games other games i like to put the fate in the let the players be responsible for their own fate so a lot of times i have them 
roll numbers for the random encounters um, to see what happens. Uh, yeah, I'm really enjoying this sea adventure and kind of having being able to take our time with it. Uh, I love that fig when exploring tonight. That was that was awesome and uncovered some things um, and that you all had a little secret powwow down in your in your chambers and you're you're kind of making some plans as it stands right now you're at a large floating um sort of way station uh that is run by a beholder with no teeth and a giant eye patch named mother of pearl so i just want to say thank you to scotty v megan ted and Jeremy, thankfully Jeremy could join us about halfway through. Um, so hail the gang is all here once again, uh, which is always the best. Um, and I want to thank all of you who joined us tonight. Thank you so much to, uh, it looks like uh, Fellowship of the Table, who some of you may remember previously as Chessick Student, our channel moderator. Uh, Dan Dillon for following uh, Joel Center. Uh, Fateful Harpy seems appropriate for the Salt Marsh campaign uh, for following the channel as well. And thank you, Quinian uh, BC, friend of the channel, for uh, the cheering those bits, earning another domain die for the party. We love all of you and appreciate you. And thank you for watching the streams. We'll be back next week with episode four um that i'm not even sure yet <laughs> what it's going to be called uh but um you can also tune in let's see this is thursday so uh tomorrow night you can see v and i and ted over on the nerdarchy channel uh for our monthly rpg crate game uh, along with uh megan and asa and uh mike mike um, I was like stuck between Mike and Fraginator. Uh, so we'll just say Michael Fraginator. Uh, but we'll be, we'll be joining that game up again on Nerdarchy tomorrow night at 8 p.m. And then uh, starting on Sunday, hopefully we can get the game back together for Chult of Personality. It's been a few weeks since we've played that one. A um, couple things happening that have prevented us from that. All That Glitters returns next Monday at 8.30 on the channel. Um, and starting next wednesday i'm very excited about this this is actually the first of what i hope will be a few more of these starting next wednesday it i think you changed the time it's now going to be 9 p.m i think um i had a message from connor i thought it was oh uh then. stay tuned we'll we'll have the <laughs> both to the dice on ice uh twitter um as well as uh mtd underscore jake for the actual start time but starting on wednesday which is august 16th i think it is uh, 15th, the 14th. 14th august 14th good lord next time I write these down i'm saying to myself not you <laughs> uh at either 8 30 or 9 p.m will be the first ever new campaign series mtd presents spire what's the campaign called the city must fall the city must fall game mastered by connor of dice on ice featuring uh megan jeff doty lloyd collins and, and philip maddie um all of whom i've had the pleasure of playing with at different times but I am not producing this game. I am not in this game, but it will be a mini terrain domain presents. They will be streaming every other Wednesday here on the channel. Um, I highly encourage you to check it out. Connor has been incredibly excited about Spire uh, for the longest time. Um, and uh, Connor is an incredible game master. All of these people are amazing role players uh megan will be producing the stream um so i'm looking forward to see what they do with it and then you'll be able to watch the vod's over on dice on ice uh each time uh that they'll post those up after there uh so be sure to tune in um and we may even run it as a rerun on the alternate wednesdays or something we'll play around with that um 
but yeah, I'm hoping we'll have a chance to feature some other people running games on the channel as well. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and head out of here for the night. One final thank you to everybody. We're going to go ahead and end the stream the same way we end every stream. And you can say it with me if you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs>